All right, we're, uh, we're going to try and step up here. Obviously, uh, some of our members are en route, and we'll work that through as time comes on, because I think there's going to be another vote coming up here quickly. We'd like to get this panel and let you uh, get on your way afterwards. So let me, let me do a couple of questions from my end as well. Um, and I, I want to set the stage in the right frame for the first time, because I think some of our conversation a little bit earlier was somewhat disingenuous. When we were talking about the MOU not being able to be worked and that people weren't understanding, we're not talking about folks on the ground or some peons out there. We're talking about high-level individuals. We're talking about the person in charge of the national park that should know what those definitions of exigent circumstances are and should not have a tizzy fit when the Border Patrol comes to an end and then he gets upset because when they decided to leave that dead end, they made a circle route instead of the three-point y, y turn that he insisted that they make in his particular park. We're talking about the National Park Director who did not know the definition. We are talking about the Director of the Utah Fish and uh, the Utah, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who was the one that sent the letter to Border Patrol and did not put the definition and threatened them with closure if they did not buy his definition of the MOU. The MOU is not working because people on the field don't understand it. It's people here in Washington that aren't getting it. The MOU may actually be working for the Department of Interior, but it's not helping national security. And that's the key issue to do with it. Now, I want to go for a few minutes with the AHO project that was done in Oregon Pipe National Monument. We already said that's 95 percent wilderness. This was dealing with the 30-mile leaner section of the border that was there. Um, once again, Ms. Thorson. The result of the negotiations with, uh, what was the result of the negotiations with Border Patrol over this AHO project? Well, at this point in time, at um, this point in time, Chairman, um, the AHO project includes four towers that are mm -hmm. situated on Oregon Pipe Cactus um, and operating now and actually have been very successful in their operation and supporting the Border Patrol security mission and actually um, our folks as well. And what did Homeland Security have to do to get that permission? In my understanding, they met with the folks on the ground, the um, superintendent and his staff, to find the appropriate locations for those towers. And what did they and have they, to pay for that? Like I'm running out of time here. I'm sorry. They paid millions of dollars in mitigation fees for those towers. Were those towers eventually moved from where the Border Patrol wanted them? Should be a yes, no answer. My understanding is that some were moved. Yeah. Okay. Um, some were not. So and what we're talking in the end, if I may finish, Mr. Chairman, in the end, um, the Border Patrol did agree, and we all um, came to the conclusion on where those um, towers could be situated and still allow them to succeed in their border security mission. But it was moved over three miles, and we had coverage blackout in areas of heavy alien inter ingress into this particular country because they were moved, and still. Border Patrol had to pay millions of dollars to, in, to Department of Interior to get that. Do they, when, when you demand money of Border Patrol for these mitigation fees, does the mitigation have to be specifically directed to the entity in which is being mitigated, or can you use that anywhere? The, the purpose of mitigation funds, for instance, in this situation, um, any activity that Now, answer occurs, the question. Does it have to be to the area where mitigation occurs, or can you use it anywhere? The funding has to be used in relation to the mitigation for that purpose, for the activity right. that took place Good. for the then towers. Tell me why, in, in 2009 of January, you and the Border Patrol once again entered into an agreement dealing with the fencing in the Rio Grande Valley sector. You got $50 million from the Department of Interior, and 22 of that, that money went to buy more land in Texas for impact of ocelots who supposedly were impacted because of the construction noise and lighting while that fence was, bid, was being built. Now, Ms. Thorson, do you know when the last time any known ocelot was found in the lower Rio Grande Natural Wildlife Refuge before this fence was constructed in 2009? I do not know that, sir. Good. I'll give you the answer. It wasn't in this century. So if there is no existing ocelot population within 20 miles of the project, how come you have to have an ocelot impactment from noise and lighting that couldn't possibly have reached them? The Fish and Wildlife Services um, and our Department of the Interior's mission is to conserve our resources, including the wildlife habitat. I only got and 30 seconds. Give me a specific answer to the question. If there is no the, ocelots down there, why did you build a resource from them with this type of money that has nothing to do with the project? It does have to do with the project, sir. The, the, the mitigation funding for the fence um, and the $50 million that you 
um, address. The, the Secre Secretary Chertoff and Kempthorne agreed that the expenditure of that funding was appropriate for those mitigation measures. There are no oslets down there. But the, the, the wildlife habitat and those locations down there, the purpose of that is to maintain habitat for the ocelot. Whether or not we have seen one recently, it is still habitat recently, for the Recently, in the ocelot. last 20 years, you haven't seen one. And yet you put half of the money from this extortion down there for that particular project. Later, I'm going to ask you about $5 million that was supposed to do for, for, for Jaguar prevention help, but half of that went to Mexico instead. We got a lot more questions about how you're using this mitigation fund and where these monies are going, and I've run out of time, so I'm going to have to yield to uh, the ranking member, Mr. Tierney. Well, again, I want to thank you for being here. I mean, I get it. I get what the, what the issues are here. I assume by this time all of you get it as well. Uh, and I don't want to keep beating a dead horse, but I. Um, you know, the, uh, the, I guess the, uh, the point is that I think there have been some situations where people have thought that it has been affected to some degree uh, by the uh, mem memorandum of agreement, by the, the laws that exist or whatever, but you believe there is a way to work it out with the memorandum of agreement and by working together cooperatively on that. Um, I was taken aback by Mr. Uh, Chaffetz's remarks that people are dying, people are dying. Can you give me any uh, instance of a person who has died as a result of the wildlife regulation or uh, environmental regulation? Uh, no. Okay. Ms. Thorson, can you? No. Mr. Jensen, can you? No, I am not aware. Okay. Um, certainly, if there were, I assume you would be with a heightened urgency to, to resolve this in some fashion, am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, I think it is disturbing to all of us that, you know, if there is a notion that there is some uh, inability of the Border Patrol to get to an area they need to get to protect our national security, I think we would all be hopping up and down. But uh, I am going to give you an opportunity again. I am not hearing that from you. you know, while there might be an isolated incidence of something being delayed, you are telling me that as far as you know, that any particular anecdotal incident has not been one that has resulted in danger or death or anything of that nature, and that you know, we probably need some processes to expedite resolution of some of these issues. And that is something that you are all charged with. Does that sound reasonable? I agree. That the, the framework exists to, to solve these problems in, in an expeditious way. Now, the, we can all um, recognize that within, in, within any relationship you are going to have different expectations, but the MOU is designed to set those expectations uniformly. Okay. So what is a bigger problem? Is the, the remoteness of these areas, the ruggedness of the terrain, is that a bigger problem than trying to work out differences over the, you know, any conflict between national security and some of these environmental or wildlife uh, regulations, or is it about the same, or is it not a well, problem? Well, there are various challenges that agents have while patrolling the border, terrain among them, um, this particular issue among them, uh, the frameworks about their authority and how they exercise it. Uh, there, are, there are concerns about private land as well uh, within the immediate border. So, that is the role of the patrol agent, to sort through those things. That is the role of leadership, to give them the vision and the plans to make that work and be effective as they possibly can within those frameworks. There are limits on all the authorities and the activity of, of Federal agencies, and, and we are not excluded from that. There was one incident in the report that was mentioned here earlier about uh, a request to put up some technology or, or um, review uh, CITUS. Uh, for that, it got delayed four months before it was implemented. Is that a particular situation that any of you have been made aware of? I, I know of the issue in, in preparation for the hearing. Can you tell me a little bit about it? As I understand it, uh, briefing, uh, there was a mobile scope truck that we wanted to move in, in, from one area to the other. Eventually, that got sorted through and we moved it. And was there a four month delay? As I understand it, yes. Okay. And what, uh, what consequences were likely to have occurred because of that delay? I am not aware of the specific things, right? So, so the, in, in the context of the operation, people wanted to move that equipment and that cap capability from one location to the other. And so under the terms, we, we need to sort through that. Under the terms of the MOU, that's what we're, those are the conversations that we are supposed to have. You would agree that four months seems extraordinary for a time to resolve such an issue? I, I, I don't know the specifics in that regard, but it, it, it seems reasonable that four months is something that we ought to be thinking about. Yeah, I mean, it as strikes me as being extraordinary, and that is something we all ought to be thinking about on that. So, Agree. Uh, so we can um, trust that it is being worked on, that that kind of delay is? In, in this case, as, as I understand it, the, the, the piece of equipment after that time period did get moved. Much more quickly? Right. Congressman? All right. Yes, I may, sir. Mr. I, uh, I may not be able to speak to the specific circumstances of that one example, but I think it is important. We have had reference to the GAO report numerous times right. today. 
And if I could, I would like to read two sentences from the report. Sure. And, uh, what page are you on? Uh, this is on the summary page, right off the, right off the front, the highlights. Okay. Uh, the, uh, we have heard this now numerous times from, from various members. Patrol agents in charge for 14 of the 17 stations reported that they have been unable to obtain a permit or permission to access certain areas in a timely manner because of how long it takes for land managers to conduct required environmental and historic property assessments. Okay. It is in the GAO report. You need to read all the way through, and I hope that the, the, our witnesses in the, on the second panel well, from the GAO. Give us a synopsis of what, uh, what the rest of it would give us if you read through. The, sec the other sentence is, despite the access delays and restrictions, and this is what really counts, 22 of the 26 agents in charge report that the overall security status of their jurisdiction is not affected by land management laws. Okay. So we have to work on the other four? Yes. We do have, we do have errors we need to work. The MOU helps with that, and we are working to address those. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I yield back with that. Representative Chaffetz. I yield to the gentleman from Utah. Do you have the report there that you just read? I have got the cover page here. Yeah, the cover page doesn't deal with it. Because other, on, on top of that, it tells how 17 to 26, 14 to 26, and I went through eight pages of documented evidence where the delays were causing problems. That, lot, that data you said of 22 out of 26, if you actually go to page 32 in the report and find out what it says, is that the agents in charge in those particular areas told us their ability to maintain operational control in this area of responsibility had been unaffected by land management laws. In other words, no portion of their station's jurisdiction had had their border security status downgraded as a result of land management laws. That is not the same thing. And yet, if you will go through that report, page after page, example after example, is an experience in which there have been delays for Border Patrol, and it is directly because of the land managers on the ground there from your department and your department. Ms. Thorson, is there ever, ever an opportunity when you do this MOU debate, MOU workout, where the Border Patrol does not have to ask your department for something. Is there ever where you actually go and have to ask them, or is Border Patrol always having to come to you and you get to make the decision on whether it is allowed or not? No, the purpose of the MOU, and, and particularly the exigent circumstances situation, they make that decision. That is why we drafted no. the framework for the To whom do they have to MOU. go for permission? The permission lies in the MOU. They, it is in their judgment, the Border Patrol's agent, agent's judgment, to execute operation, exigent circumstance or emergency pursuit in when they feel the need. Then go back to the, to the report and read what happens there, because that request has to be approved by the land manager. And if the land manager doesn't, then all hell is there to pay. This MOU does not work because it is an unfair MOU, which means Border Patrol has to come to you and beg for permission. And time after time after time, you are not granting that permission and you are not doing it in a timely fashion. And when you do do it, then you ask for unmitigated amounts of money which Congress has no control. We do not know how much money you are getting from Border Patrol. We don't know where you are spending it. And the one time we tried to get in the in Appropriations Act, so that you actually gave us a list of what you are getting and where you are spending it. It was removed in a conference committee report. There are so many problems that are down there, it makes one's head spin, especially with the rhetoric that we are getting here today. I yield back to the, to the chairman. I am reclaiming my time. Uh, Mr. Vitello, it, my understanding is, according to the GAO, they classify about 129 miles or 15 percent were classified as, of the border were classified as, quote, unquote, controlled, and that the remaining 85 percent were classified as managed. Can you explain the difference from your understanding of the two? It, it, it has to do with the revision of the national strategy in 2004. We defined what we believed was operational control for the context of building resources along the border. So specific to the plans that were made in sectors and in station level planning, what we decided was operational control meant that you had the ability to detect, identify, classify, respond, and resolve to intrusions at the immediate border. It is a very so, ta tactical definition designed for the local people to understand what they believe so their what capabilities is, what is and resources were. So manage, the difference between manage and control is the amount of timing from the, the, our resolution to uh, the, from the incursion. So, so control at the immediate border would, would happen in real time at the immediate border, and manage would be some, some part, portion less than that, or, or 
it would take longer to get to that. And you have talked about how over the course of your career you have gone from just a few thousand agents to roughly 20,000 agents, was my? We are we're currently just over 20,000, that is correct. Just over 20,000. Yet I look here at this map and I look at the Tucson region as compared to, say, either Yuma or El Paso or Del Rio, whatever you want. Why is it that 51 percent of the problem seems to be in the Tucson region? Why is that? We believe it is because of our success in other areas. The, we, we have managed. When I came in the Border Patrol, nobody met. I am trying matter. to figure out why you are having little to no success in Tucson. We are having great success in Tucson. How can, our, how can you say that? Listen, I have. I have watched us build You are having great resources. You are the head of this agency. I, you, I, sir, I was in Tucson in, 2000, in the year 2000 when we were catching 1.5 million people. You are having great success. Across the Southwest border. And over 600,000 of those people were coming in through the Tucson sector. Last year alone, we were at 51 percent. This year, we are at 44 percent. Now, is that wild success? Is that, you know, you just we, said it was great success. We have done a lot of work this year, last year, the year before, and since 2000 when it was completely out of control there. We are maintaining what we've ha have, the gains we have made in Tucson and, and are, are per proceeding to give that area resources that, like they have never seen before. CBP has over 6,000 employees in the State of Arizona. We, we alone have, in the Tucson sector alone, nearly 4,000, and we are moving toward a, a, a number over 4,000. Uh, there is more technology out there than it has ever been. We, we spoke about the Ajo Towers and the Tucson My 1. My time has expired. I think you are I, I. Uh, Mr. Kilby. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vitello, uh, you mentioned earlier in your testimony that uh, in carrying out uh, various responsibilities that you uh, consult with the tribes. Uh, how is that working out? Is that uh, uh, running uh, as you would want it to run? Sure. So we have, we have within the public lands liaison uh, apparatus. We have people who are designed to do liaison work. Uh, the leadership also uh, pays attention to the relationships that exist uh, at the, for the Indian nations that are at the immediate border. Mm -hmm. well, I am very happy to hear that. I, sometimes uh, agencies tend to forget that. We know that Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution says that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations, the several states, and Indian tribes. So that is the constitutional basis for that. And I am always, uh, with any group, uh, whenever you are called upon to uh, uh, work with the Indian tribes, and it works well in Michigan. We have 12 tribes in Michigan, and it works well there. And I, uh, you find it is working well in your area also, or well, your area is very broad. Similarly, uh, the, the you know, relationships are, are need constant maintenance, and so the things ebb, ebb and flow. Um, but we, we understand the import of our responsibilities there, and leadership in the field takes those responsibilities seriously. Good. I commend you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Or if you don't have questions, I'll just go to Pierce. Yeah. Okay, Representative Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jensen, how many miles of roads are in the border zone of the Coronado Forest? Uh, I would have to get back to you on the specific number of miles of roads. You wouldn't happen to know that, would you, Mr. Vitello? I do not. You all don't do patrols out there? In the Coronado is part, is part of the area the Tucson sector covers, yes. Mm -hmm. You got anybody in the audience that might know that? We will have to get back to the sir. The, uh, Mr. Vitello, you just uh, stated in response to a question that the framework exists to solve the problem uh, with respect to getting into areas with limited access by Federal law, that would be wilderness and such areas is that did I hear you correctly? That's correct. Um, and then did I hear you correctly that in cases of danger and death that you would have a heightened sense of emergency? Yes. Can you explain why 68 percent of Oregon Pipe is still uh, people are advised not to go in there, American citizens are advised not to go in there, 
doesn't it qualify as an area if you tell people don't go in there that it might they might uh, not come out alive wouldn't that be danger or death wouldn't that move it sort of to the top of the list of your heightened sense zone by zone uh, area by area we're, we're concerned with our responsibilities within the area of the immediate border and so organ pipe is a challenge because of its status, it is also a challenge because of the activity that is there. Um, but we are making plans, we have made plans, we are making investments um, to put that situation in hand. Yeah, it has been that way for, when did they first uh, start putting that off limits to people? I, I'm, I, I don't know that specifically, but I am going to guess it is somewhere around the 2000 time frame when it was, was a lot busier yeah, than so, it is so now. So you have had 10 or so years, and 11 or whatever. Um, Ms. Thorson, I am interested, uh, again, we are talking about how easy it is to work with wilderness and it doesn't affect us in the least. I mean, that is sort of the testimony. Can you explain the reasoning behind not allowing a surveillance tower in the Oregon uh, pipe wilderness? And uh, it was forced to be placed outside the wilderness in a place that couldn't see as much of the border and as well. Uh, wouldn't that be an effect or is that just sort of come into the close but not qualify category? Um, under the provisions of the Wilderness Act, um, one of the challenges we have had is placement of permanent structure, which is, would be a tower. Um, in negotiations and discussions that we have had with the Border Patrol and the park, um, they moved those towers in locations within the boundary of the wilderness, but that are not designated, that chunk of land is not designated specifically wilderness. So they are actually generally in the same vicinity. Um, they just are not sitting on what is designated as wilderness. Yeah, and uh, so in this case, are you trying to tell me that the alternate site had as good a visibility as the site that was in the wilderness? Because it, we have exactly the opposite testimony. And if that is the case, if you choose a case with less surveillance capacity, then I still, along with my colleagues, don't understand how you can sit here with a straight face and say that it doesn't affect, that everything is okay, that the framework exists. I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. If I may respond, um, Congressman. That is up to the Chairman. If I may re respond, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the Congressman's um, point. Um, in, in working with the Border Patrol, um, the Border Patrol, and I am going to speak some for Mr. Botello here, um, there, if the, if the tower does not give them the totality of what they want to see, what they will do is implement additional measures to fill that gap. And for instance, in their new approach, SBI Net has gone away, in, the integrated tower, um, integrated fixed tower approach. They will supplement those areas with mobile sur surveillance units or RVSS sites or other types of technology to fill those gaps. So they will, they, they will not go uncovered um, um, between technology and resources. I will pass your assurances along to the constituents of mine who live along the border who are scared to death every day, who witnessed or who know the family that was killed and whose family itself lives in our district. I will uh, give them your reassurances. Thank you. Are there any other questions that people have for another round? Raul, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I, I yield my time to oh. Mr. Chaffetz. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Vitello. Um, I want to clarify. Are you aware of anybody who has been killed along this border region that we are talking about here? Wh which, uh, there I mean, I talked about specifically about the problems that we are having in, in Arizona. And Mr. Tierney's questions about people are dying, are they not dying? Are there, there, there have been deaths mm -hmm. along the border, and there, there, there have been that, are, that directly impact the Border Patrol, yes. Gentleman Yield. Yes, please. Just so we all understand, my question was whether there are people dying in direct correlation to the lack of enforcement of an environmental or, a, uh, or one of these other laws that we are discussing today, not whether people are dying. So let's be genuine about this. Correct. As, as I, in the context of that question, this specific issue has not caused deaths that I am aware of. Thank you very much. So you are not aware of anybody dying that is coming north, trying to go through the areas, going through the Oregon Pipe National Forest? You are not, not aware of anybody who's died doing that? Look, there, there are deaths along the immediate border for people who dehydrate or, or get separated and north, from and, their smugglers. And coming north, correct? I mean, That's right. Just, That's I don't right. know how you define immediate border, but 
the legal definition is 100 miles. So you, you're telling me that you're not aware of anybody that has died as a result of our lack of ability to move in mechanized vehicles on protected lands? No, I'm not aware no, of that. <laughs> we will go through this in greater detail. I, 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 anyway, let's go to Mr. Mr. Jensen here. And your written, written testimony states that the, the Forest Service has dedicated 13 officers to the border zone of the Coronado Forest. Ten of them are accompanied by canine units. What is the Forest Service's total commitment to the border zone across the southwest border? Are those officers armed, and what capacity do they have to stop illegal activity and defend themselves against criminals with high-powered weapons? I will stand to be corrected, but I understand there is on the range of perhaps 50 agents in the southwestern region of the Forest Service. Are they armed? To my understanding, yes, they are. And are they able to apprehend somebody? Yes, they are. How often does that happen? I would have to get back to you on the specifics of how often that happens, but they are in constant contact and un undertake joint operations with the Border Patrol and apprehension activities, so I would imagine that it would be a fairly routine duty. Your written testimony states that the Forest Service and the, the Border Patrol, quote, rely on each other's strengths to work towards a common goals and mutual interest for the public and the national forests, end quote. To basically to protect the endangered uh, and sensitive species. According to the Coronado National Forest website, this includes the Mexican gray wolf, cactus, uh, the pygmy owl, the desert pupfish, and the pima pineapple cactus. Are we to believe that the Forest Service and the Border Patrol are balancing our national security with a pina, pima pineapple uh, cactus and the desert pupfish? It is not that sort of trade-off, sir. We look at the, the existing laws on the books that require us to, to protect those threatened and endangered species. And it's but as Mr. It Bishop pointed out, why is, that, why is it deferred to, in the balance of the MOU, why is it that you are given deference that they can't do what they think is best to secure the United States of America and secure their officers? They have to come get permission. That is the problem. That is why we are here today. As Ms. Thorson has testified, it, and it is our experience in the Forest Service, that the Border Patrol has all full authority to pursue suspects in all cases and circumstances around the border. We in not, all circumstances? That is your understanding of the MOU? In, in all circumstances? We have not run into any trouble in the, on the Forest Service lands in this regard. You, they have full and unfettered access to use motorized vehicles. In, in the exigent and emergency no, circumstances? No, no, no. Okay. So that is different than full and unfettered access, which you just said. Allow me to clarify then. In the, in the case that is outlined in the, within the MOU, the, the Border Patrol has the ability to pursue suspects, be they on foot, be they on horseback, or be they on, on vehicle, when the terrain and the circumstances dictate. And it is their decision and control when they do that. I, uh, I have a, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, and to the ranking member, everybody here, I have a serious problem where we are prioritizing desert pupfish above national security. I just personally believe that we really ought to be protecting the United States of America and protecting those officers who are putting their lives in line every single day. Gentlemen, when we have like delays, when we have delays the way we have, I just find it unconscionable. The gentleman yield. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think the delay issue we all have an issue with, and, and that's one of the things I left you. But I want to try to narrow, nail something down here, uh, the three of you. When we have laws, the environmental law or, or the uh, wilderness law, things of those nature, uh, the laws are in effect, but you have memorandums of agreement as to how you will strike a balance when there is a competing interest. Am I right on that? Correct. Yes. Okay. And one of the competing issues would be a national security issue uh, when somebody from the Border Patrol thought that it was an exigent circumstance or an emergency that they get into an area, correct? Correct. correct. And in those instances where they think the national security is at risk or there is an emergency or an exigent situation, it is the Border Patrol agent and no one else who uses their professional judgment and determines whether or not they will go in there by mechanized vehicle or any other way. Is that correct? That is correct. Correct. Ms. Jensen? Correct. So they are not setting up some pupfish or whatever it is off against something else. Their determination, their professional judgment is, does national security require that we go in there by whatever means necessary? And when they make that decision, it overrides interior, it overrides forestry, it overrides everybody else. Am I correct? Right. That's yes, right. sir. Thank you. Yield back. I, I would, I would uh, say uh, to my friend uh, from Massachusetts, A, exigent circumstances has not been clearly defined. It has not been clearly de delineated. Number two, routinely, 
that Border Patrol is not able to do what it is able to do in other areas in terms of locating towers, operating uh, with vehicles. You know, I wasn't going to do this, but I think I am going to do this. If you have a sensitive heart, if you, I am telling you, this is the most graphic thing I have ever seen. If you are a young child, don't watch this. I am going to show you four slides that are happening right near our border. This is on the Mexican side of the border. And this is what I am concerned about, what we are putting our men and women down there and saying, go protect us. But we are not going to give you all the resources because we are worried about the pupfish. So, you know, you go on horseback, you go, you go just walk it. Go ahead and let's show the first slide. And just roll through these. We are going to do this swiftly. Don't look if you are sensitive to any sort of graphic image. Mr. Chairman, okay? point of clarification. This is the kind of thing that we are sending our agents to deal with Mr. Chairman, on a daily basis. Mr. Chairman, point of clarification. State. Sure. Is there a contention that our Border Patrol people and Interior people and, uh, and others are responsible for the Mexican side of the border, where these films are from? Let's keep going. They are dealing with this threat coming through the United States of America. They are having to deal with this by the hundreds. You can turn them off. Please turn them off. They are having to deal with this by the hundreds of thousands. I, in good conscience, cannot be a participant in the United States Congress and not give every tool and resource to the Border Patrol to secure that border. I don't give a crap about the pupfish. I do care about America, and I do care about those Border Patrol agents. And when you tell them they have to go on horseback when they would much rather be in a vehicle, that is fundamentally wrong. I yield back. Okay. We'll, uh, if, do you want another minute? In fairness. No, no. I mean, look, I think we have made the point 100 right. times here that the Border Patrol people are in whatever vehicle they think they need to be in at the proper time, and I think we can leave it at that. Thank you. I appreciate that. The answers you gave him make sure they are enforced in some way. And you can be happy the That's Pupfish right. has a 52 acre buffer zone that has been paid for by Border Security. So we wish uh, to appreciate the witnesses for your testimony. Members of both committees have initial, if they have additional questions for the witnesses, are asked to, re, uh, to submit those, and we will ask for you to respond for them in writing. We are now ready for the next panel of witnesses. Um, and do you need some time to reconfigure the table here? Can I suggest sure. we recess till the next vote. Uh, for the next panel of witnesses, we are also going to have to, uh, they will need to be sworn in, but I would like, and, and especially while Mr. Pierce is here, to welcome up to the panel uh, George Zachary Taylor, who is a retired Border Patrol officer and a founding member of the National Association of Former Border Patrol Officers. We will invite Jean Wood, who is also a retired Border Patrol officer and founding member of the National Association of Former Border Patrol Officers. Mr. Wood. Uh, will be introduced by our colleague, Mr. Pierce, if you would like to take a few minutes to do it, do it justice. Chairman Chavitz and uh, Chairman Bishop, members of the subcommittee, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here on the dais with you today. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, my friend and constituent, Jean Wood of Las Cruces, New Mexico. Jean spent 30 years in the Border Patrol and served as sector chief in McAllen, Texas, and San Diego, California. I look forward to his testimony and to the testimony of the other witnesses here, but thanks again and uh, welcome in from New Mexico, sir. Thanks. Thank you. I also want to recognize uh, Jim Chilton, who is a fifth generation cattleman whose land stewardship practices have won him awards. His family ranch is 55 miles southwest of Tucson and includes four miles of border, as well as Ms. Mittal. Is the first name Anu? That's the first name I've got right today. Thank you. And Umital, who is the Director of Natural Resources and Environment for the General Accounting Office, and I understand you are the author of the GAO report that we have been referencing throughout this case. Mr. Chaffetz. It's the custom of the Oversight and Government Reform uh, Committee to uh, swear in all witnesses. If you'd please raise, rise and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? Let the record reflect they answered all in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank, we thank you all for being here. As mentioned to the earlier panel, the practice, I, I just said that, as mentioned to the earlier panel, uh, all of your written testimony will appear in the hearing record. 
You will have five minutes to summarize it. The lights in front of you will, I hope, give you the countdown. The yellow flight comes on. It means you have a minute left. The red light means we'll ask you to finish your testimony as we can. Now, I'll also tell you that we are going to have another series of votes sometime soon. What I would like to do is try to get as far along as we can so we don't have to hold you. I hope none of you have afternoon plane flights going out of here because it ain't going to happen. But I, I appreciate you being here. So if we could, Mr. Wood, if we'll just go left to right again, if you would like to be the first one to give your testimony, we would appreciate hearing from you. Thank you very much, Chairman uh, Chaffetz and Bishop. And thank you to uh, Mr. Pierce for his Gracious. Sir, if that thing moves, can move any closer to you so we can hear you a little bit better, it's hard to hear. Is that better, sir? That's much better. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Gene Wood. As a retired member of the U.S. Border Patrol and founding member of the National Association of Former Border Patrol Officers, it's, it's a real honor for me to talk today on the merits of the proposed legislation. I do not represent the Border Patrol in today's proceedings. Instead, my testimony will rely largely on personal knowledge and the expertise of hundreds of former agents uh, who are members of our organization. Their many years of collective experience, I believe, will enhance my ability to present to you informative, accurate information and conclusions. The Border Patrol was established in 1924, and for nearly 87 years, the supervisors and their agents have successfully developed techniques and strategies to prevent the illegal entry of uh, aliens into our country. One of the most effective of these uh, techniques is deterrence. It has proven to be a desirable strategy because it does not involve the dangers involved in physical arrests. It does not involve costs always incurred in the detention and removal of aliens. Today, I would like to address part of my testimony to enforcement efforts in the Tucson sector of the Border Patrol. I've chosen that sector because I served there before I was chief as the deputy chief. Uh, it's one of the largest sectors uh, on our southern border. It has 261 miles of common border with Mexico. Additionally, the sector area of responsibility contains large uh, areas with various restrictive land designations. Since 2004, leadership of that sector has changed frequently with, subsequent, with successive assignments of some of the most distinguished and experienced chiefs in the Border Patrol. With the support of Congress, the agency workforce has, incru has increased, uh, and we have even experimented with uh, the assignment of uh, National Guard troops Technology has been approved, improved. Uh, I, I believe, gentlemen, as does the National Association of Former Border Patrol Officers, that the difficulties encountered by the Border Patrol to gain operational control are not the result of poor management or lack of resources. It's simply an issue of denied access. Unfortunately, our country's willingness to accept these unwise restrictions has been aggravated in recent years by the unrelenting pressure of drug cartels and other international criminal enterprises. That brings us to one of the most difficult questions facing present Border Patrol supervisors and agents. How do we protect our national security successfully in these highly restricted areas? The time-proven and effective technique gained through years of experience are severely limited or at times completely eliminated because of these self-imposed restrictions. Expensive technologies cannot be efficiently implemented and manpower assets become more difficult to utilize. For these reasons, 
the leadership of the National Association of Former Border Patrol Officers enthusiastically endorses the decisive remedies proposed by Congressman Bishop. This includes the 100-mile limits and waiver of all the restrictions listed in that proposed legislation. We believe that if enacted, it will have a high probability of success, and it is an absolute necessary first step to achieve our goal, our national goal of operational control. We also believe that the approval of this proposed legislation will help convince the American public that Congress is now seriously seeking remedies to improve national security and public safety of our citizens. There is another reason it makes perfect sense to do this. My time is up. We do have, thank you, you do have your written report as well, and will there be questions for you at yes, the sir. same time? And I still think we're going on the floor, so we have more time here. Mr. Taylor, if you'd like to go, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Chairman Bishop, Chairman Chaffetz, members of the committee, thank you for allowing the National Association of Former Border Patrol Officers to address this distinguished assembly. I'm here to speak for passage of Mr. Bishop's legislation, H.R. 1505, National Security and Federal Lands Protection Act. This bill is brilliant in its simplicity. Why? Because the primary purpose of border security is to ensure national security and promote public safety for all Americans, including Border Patrol agents on the border. Each of you represent constituents, towns, and communities that have been adversely affected by illegal immigration and drug smuggling. No community in the United States is safe from these transnational criminals and criminal organizations. As long as the external borders of the United States remain open to them, they will continue to come. The level of violence these groups are capable of and routinely employ is incomprehensible to any civilized person. Border Patrol agents in Arizona spend a significant amount of time patrolling public lands because much of the land along the Arizona border is public land. These agents report that the Department of Homeland Security and Bureau of Customs and Border Protection are intentionally misrepresenting the situation along the southern border, especially concerning the relative safety of the border area and the number of aliens detected that get away. Therefore, I am here today to tell you what rank and file Border Patrol officers are unwilling to tell you, even if subpoenaed and placed under oath for fear of reprisal from their employer. The agents in the field are saying that the Nogales, Arizona urban border area has become a more dangerous place to work and that the Federal public lands surrounding Nogales have evolved into a lawless area routinely prowled by heavenly armed drug and alien smugglers from Mexico. Additionally, agents do not have unencumbered access on all public lands to patrol the border. The concept is simple. If you cannot access the border, you cannot patrol the border, and therefore you cannot secure the border. Limited access areas, including wilderness and refuge areas, present a greater likelihood that agents will encounter armed criminals who will not hesitate to fire upon them, and that the probability that if anyone is seriously injured, they will surely die before that injured person can be safely transported or evacuated because of access issues. There is also the fact that they are reluctant to patrol these areas effectively because they may find themselves the subject of a dispute between their agency and the agency controlling the land they seek to patrol. To the agent on the ground, the very idea that a plant or some obscure animal is more important than their life is an unsettling reality that further discourages them in their efforts to secure the border. You need to protect our Border Patrol agents. An existing palpable concern is the perceived lack of interest on the part of the Department of Homeland Security to aggressively pursue criminals that kill or do, attempt to kill or do kill Border Patrol agents. To sweep these issues under the carpet is reprehensible. Here I have a copy of the Arizona Hunting and Trapping Regulation showing, and I quote from the Homeland Security issues along the international border may affect the quality of a person's hunt. 
The delineated area goes from the California border to the New Mexico border and includes all land south of Interstate Highways 8 and 10 and north as far as Arizona City, that line passing to the near west of Tucson. We have recent reports of agents following tracks of an all-terrain vehicle that crossed the border illegally near Lukeville, Arizona. They followed the trail across public lands north into Maricopa County, which is Phoenix, and apprehended a load of marijuana on an all-terrain vehicle driven by a 15-year-old illegal alien with a rifle. Department of Interior employees have erected vehicle barriers 70 to 80 miles north of the Mexican border in the tabletop wilderness to prevent smuggling vehicles from driving further north. I could go on for hours with individual examples of why this legislation is necessary. However, my five minutes is nearly up. We urge you to support Mr. Bishop's bill, H.R. 1505, to protect federal lands and our Border Patrol agents by signing on as a co-sponsor as soon as possible to give the Border Patrol agent on the ground the unencumbered access to federal public lands within 100 miles of the border they must have to secure the border and provide them the reassurance that the United States Congress is behind them in that effort. Thank you very much. Mr. Chilton, we recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, if you can pull that closer to your mouth so we can hear it. Thank you, Mr. Perfect. Chairman. I am a rancher, and ranchers shoot straight. And it was really upsetting to sit here and listen to the bureaucratic double talk by the Forest Service Fish and Wild, or the BLM, and the Border Patrol. I live on the border. Four miles of my ranch is the international border. The border is not signed or marked and consists of a five strand barbed wire fence similar to the one one sees the long highways. There is no wall, and you would never know it was the international border by viewing it. But the cartels know. We strongly believe that the border control patrol must control the border at the border, not 10, 20, or 100 miles inside America. We have heard that and it was a few years ago, that the Border Patrol found several backpacks near our ranch which contained Yemeni passports. We wondered whether the owners of the backpacks were tourists or terrorists. We must protect the national security above all else. National security must not be trumped by environmental laws or federal land managers. It would seem impossible to win World War II if the military had been forced to comply with current laws such as the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, and other acts enacted by Congress after World War II. The construction of thousands of military bases and airfields and port facilities inside the United States during the war would have been delayed for years. Wouldn't it make sense for, to control the border at the border by completing the border fence? There's no border fence from Nogales uh, to Sasabe, uh, about 50, 60 miles. And wouldn't it make sense to have functioning 21st century communications near the border? installing cameras and sensors and using drones and helicopters and satellites and uh, other proven technologies developed by the military. The Border Patrol needs to be able to construct roads, helicopter pads, and place forward operation bases at very close or, to the, or next to the border and be free of impediments uh, caused by environmental laws and federal land managers. Land managers must not be allowed to interfere with the access of, essential, of the essential uh, use of land to protect we the citizens. Recently, environmental mitigation diversions resulted in 50 million 
of Border Patrol funds being transferred to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for alleged environmental damage. The real environmental damage is being caused by drug and people traffickers whose impact is enormously more harmful to the border than the Border Patrol. We are told that the Border Patrol, by the Border Patrol, that approximately 20 percent of the undocumented border crossers have criminal records. Criminals engage in human and drug transportation find it convenient to use wildlife refuges and wilderness areas as easy corridors to hide and travel. My fellow rancher, Rob Krentz, was murdered with the killer escaping back to Mexico through the San Bernardino National Refuge. Emphatically, we oppose the designation of any and all new wilderness areas, wildlands, or refuges within 100 miles of the southern border. Such designations are virtual gifts to Mexican cartels. It is outrageous that hundreds of Mexican cartel scouts with the best binoculars, night vision, and encrypted satellite phones have been found to occupy the tops of mountains near our ranch and near our house and dozens of miles inside the border. As a consequence, the foreign cartel scouts know where the Border Patrol is located at all times and can then carefully guide AK-47 gun packing druggers and people smugglers through the mountains and valleys without being spotted by the Border Patrol. We have been burglarized twice. Ranchers in the border area cannot leave their houses unguarded for a few hours since their homes are likely to be broken into uh, if someone is not there. We live with weapons near our bed. Our doors have weapons next to them. We have weapons in our vehicles, and we attach we weapons in our scabbards on our saddles. The Border Patrol must control the border at the border so that citizens' civil rights, property rights, and human rights are protected. Ranchers along the border cannot have peace of mind until the border is, in fact, secured. I appreciate that. Just so you know, there's a vote that's going on right now, and what we have told members is to go quickly vote and then come back. So we're not walking out of this. There will be people coming back here again. Ms. Mattel. Uh, Chairman Chavitz and members of the com committees, I am very pleased to be here today to participate in your joint hearing on environmental laws and Border Patrol operations. As you know, 40 percent of the southwest border is Federal land managed by the Departments of the Interior and Agriculture. Even though these lands are characterized by remote and rugged terrain, they have not deterred illegal border crossers whose activities have damaged the environment by creating thousands of miles of illegal trails, dumping tons of trash, and causing wildfires to escape on these lands. Border Patrol and land agency officials both recognize that stopping illegal traffic as close to the border as possible is essential not only to protect national security, but also to protect the natural and cultural resources on Federal lands. Last fall, GAO issued two reports on Border Patrol operations on Federal lands along the southwest border. My testimony today will summarize the key findings of both of these reports. These reports were prepared collaboratively by staff in GAO's Homeland Security and Justice Team and GAO's Natural Resources and Environment Team. Accompanying me today is Rich Stana, the director who leads GAO's work on border security issues. First, we found that Border Patrol must comply with various land management laws such as NEPA, ESA, and the Wilderness Act when conducting operations on Federal lands. Under these laws, Border Patrol, like other Federal agencies, must obtain permission from the land agencies before agents can undertake activities such as maintaining roads and installing surveillance equipment on Federal lands. To help implement these laws, Border Patrol and the land agencies have developed several interagency agreements. We heard today about the 2006 MOU 
and these have led to numerous instances of enhanced cooperation and better access for Border Patrol on some Federal lands. However, we also found instances where, despite these interagency agreements, land management laws had impacted Border Patrol's access to Federal lands. For example, 14 of the 26 stations, as was earlier mentioned, responsible for patrolling Federal lands along the southwest border told us that they sometimes face delays because of the length of time it takes land managers to complete NEPA requirements before a permit can be issued. We found that some of these delays could have been reduced if Border Patrol had used its own resources to perform required NEPA environmental assessments and other delays could have been reduced if the agencies had conducted programmatic environmental impact statements for the region as allowed under the Act. We recommended that the agencies take these steps to avoid such delays in the future. In addition, five stations told us that because of the ESA and the presence of endangered species, they had to change the timing or location of their ground and air patrols. However, they also told us that these changes had not affected their ability to detect or apprehend illegal aliens on Federal lands. Second, we found that while land management laws had caused delays and restrictions, they had not impacted the operational control status for 22 of the 26 Border Patrol stations along the southwest border. Instead, we found that 18 of these stations reported that the remoteness and ruggedness of the terrain and dense vegetation had affected their level of operational control on Federal lands more than access delays or restrictions caused by the land management laws. According to these stations, the key to obtaining operational control on Federal lands on the southwest border is to have a sufficient number of agents, have access to additional technology, and have additional tactical infrastructure. They did not identify changing the environmental laws as a key requirement. Four stations along the southwest border did tell us that their ability to achieve or maintain operational control for Federal lands under their jurisdiction had been affected by land management laws. However, only two of these stations had requested additional resources to facilitate increased or timelier access to regain operational control. In both of these cases, their requests were denied by senior Border Patrol officials because of other higher agency priorities. Finally, seven years ago, we were very critical of the lack of information sharing and communication that existed between the Border Patrol and the land agencies. In 2010, however, we found that the agencies had made significant progress in some areas as a result of the implementation of various interagency agreements. But we also found that they could still take additional steps to ensure that coordination of threat information occurs in a timely manner and that agencies have compatible radio communications. The agencies are currently taking actions to implement our recommendations. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement. I would be happy to respond to any questions you have. Thank you. I appreciate all of you for giving your statements. Uh, they will be there for the record. And if I forget at the end, if members have additional statements that are written, we may ask you to respond to those at the same time in a timely fashion. Ms. Mattel, let me go through a couple of questions then, if I could, before the rest of my colleagues. As I understood you as you are talking here, it was a very nice, very balanced report as you did here, but you did find a correlation between environmental laws and delays at the Border Patrol's ability to get permission and permits from some land managers? What we found is that the implementation of the environmental laws had resulted in delays and restrictions. This is a question that you never ask questions if I don't know what the answer is, but I, I ask it of one of the other panelists, and I want to give you your question as well. In all of these, um, all of these uh, issues that you went through, did you ever find a chance when the when the request was made that it was Border Patrol always asking the Interior or Ag for permission. It was never the other way around. Or did, am I, did um, I miss I, one? You asked that question earlier. And one of the things that we noticed was that Border Patrol has a lot of flexibility under these acts to actually undertake a number of these environmental assessments themselves, and they have not been doing that. And as long as they are allowed to do that. I appreciate that very, very much. Thank you. Let me ask a couple of other questions for, all, for the other three witnesses, Mr. Wood, Mr. Chilton, Mr. Taylor. In your opinion, 
from your experience on the ground, and actually I wish the other panel was here to listen to some of your testimony as well, are environmental laws such as the Endangered Species Wilderness Act compatible with border security? And do you have examples of the problem that you did, yet that you have seen with those? Uh, any of you, uh, Mr. Chilton, go ahead and why don't you just go down that row with them? The answer is, is no. National security should not be trumped by environmental laws or rules and regulations of the different departments like Interior, Forest Service, and Fish and Wildlife. There is a refuge in uh, Arizona called the San Pedro National Conservation Area. It starts at the international border where the San Pedro River enters the United States. There is a wall that comes each way and stops, and there is a 1,500-foot gap. The refuge is two mile or two miles wide, and the conservation area is 50 miles long. The Border Patrol has no access into that area except at the border, and that is limited access. It is a path for druggers, illegals, and perhaps terrorists to walk 50 miles into the United States. And how does the Border Patrol try to, to patrol it? They patrol the perimeter. So if you have 50 miles one way and 50 miles the other way and two miles on the end, uh, that's 102 more miles of fence that the Border Patrol has to patrol. And they are not allowed into it. The roads, since it's become a national conservation area, have deteriorated so you can't drive. And the refuge or the conservation district manager will not let the Border Patrol or anyone grade the roads and have access in there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Wood, Mr. Taylor, let me, let me change that question slightly for you. Your former Border Patrol agents. Do you see anything fundamentally strange that the Border Patrol has unlimited access on private property, but does not have unlimited access on public property to do their jobs? Mr. Wood? Uh, thank you for the, for the question. It, it has not gone, gone unnoticed to us that the memor memorandum of understanding that we have discussed earlier, it is nine pages of single-spaced typing. It is complicated to read, but the point I am making here is in contrast to that MOU, uh, the Federal statute now in, now in effect allows Border Patrol unrestricted entry within a distance of 25 miles from any external boundary and to have access to private lands but not dwellings for the purpose of patrolling the border to prevent illegal entry of aliens into the, United, into the United States, that statement is contained in only four sentences in paragraph A3 of section 287 of the Immigration Nationality Act. Thank you. My, my time has expired here, although I just want to, one th I read one of the footnotes that you put in there that I thought was interesting. In the 1990 Arizona Desert Act that created one of these wildlife refuges, it was specifically in there the language that any kind of wilderness designation or environmental designation would not be allowed to interfere with the concept of national security. I found that a unique concept there. Maybe when we come have some other time, I can come back and ask you to respond to that one. Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Border Patrol agent that was uh, here um, represented that he thought what was happening in the Tucson region was great success. How, how would you react to that, Mr. Tilden? The Border Patrol still is not at the border. The Border Patrol is doing uh, what they can. I respect what they are trying to do, but the border is not secure. They can't get down to the border. They try to patrol 5, 10, 15 miles inside the border. 
and allow us to live in a no man's land. Uh, there has been some diminishment in traffic across. But when I talk to the Border Patrol people in Nogales, they say the traffic is moving further west into the Indian Nation and into the Oregon Pipe area. And, the, and we don't see the people moving across our ranch. At one time there's 30 or 40,000 people coming through a year. We don't see those people anymore because there are scouts on top of the mountains who are guiding the cartels and the people smugglers through our ranch and other ranches. And uh, the Border Patrol is known, it, they know where the Border Patrol is at all times. And the Border Patrol doesn't see them, and they move right through the country, clear on to Pinal County and to uh, Phoenix. How, how dangerous is it there? Well, when we are riding horseback, I pack two guns, a rifle and a pistol. And if I see uh, people coming along with an AK-47 and a whole bunch of people with backpacks with drugs in them, I go the other way, fast. If I have to, I'll fall off my horse and go to shooting. It's dangerous. It's dangerous, and we should not have to live under those conditions. The border should be controlled at the border. Uh, Mr. Taylor, how, how, what, uh, can you talk to me a little bit about the, the morale that you are seeing there and how, they, how do these agents deal with the differences between what they can do in, in other areas and what they can do in wilderness type uh, designation areas? Well, they find out that in not only just the wilderness designations, but the uh, public land that adjoins the wilderness, and I am talking specifically about the Pajarita wilderness. One of the first actions I had when I went there as a supervisor, at that time, you may or may not be aware, we had Federal troops supporting the Border Patrol. We had a, a combat uh, alert team from the Marine Corps base uh, working in conjunction with us. And a firefight ensued, uh, this was back in 1989, I believe, between the uh, Marines and the uh, Packers. And, uh, the uh, land managers was not concerned about the fact that we had a firefight. They were concerned about the fire that ensued in the wilderness area, and so we had to quit going in there. And how big a, how big a space and area was that? Um, that particular area, in in that there's a protected area within the protected area, and that's where they were. And the reason the Marines were there is because that is where the smugglers chose to come through the border. And that internal inside of the wilderness is relatively small. I think it is 150 acres. Ms. Mittal, a good question for you. Did they, did this definition between controlled and managed, did you feel like that there was um, a unified vision and understanding of those two definitions and what, what was truly controlled and what wasn't controlled? We use the Border Patrol's definition of operational control, so that when we were talking to their agents, patrol agents in charge, we were using definitions that they, their agency had developed and that they should have been fully understanding of. So that is why we used the definition of operational control that was defined by the Border Patrol. Very good. Uh, my time has expired. I yield back. Mr. Kildee, do you have questions for these witnesses? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony. Um, I'd like to ask um, Ms. Mitchell, did, you, did the GAO find that any environmental laws need to be repealed or dramatically altered in order for the Border Patrol to effectively perform its mission? During our audit, what we found is that it was the implementation of the environmental laws that was causing the delays and restrictions that the Border Patrol agents had identified. 
they, nobody recommended that there was a particular law or a particular provision of the law that needed to be changed. What we noted was that the MOU that was implemented by the three agencies were, was not effective in implementing the environmental laws. So Congress then in its uh, position should have perhaps more hearings on how we can better have the, the uh, enforcement of these laws then? In our, in our review of the four laws that were repeatedly cited by Border Patrol, what we found is that the environmental laws provide a lot of flexibility as well as a lot of options, and that the Border Patrol has not exercised all of the flexibilities and all of the options that are provided to it under these environmental laws. So it is very easy to go back to the, and blame the land management agencies when you have not yet taken the actions that the laws provide you as the action agency. So I think the reason we did not make any suggestions or recommendations about changing the environmental laws was because there are flexibilities and options available to Border Patrol that it has not yet exhausted in trying to comply with the environmental laws. Okay. Um, based uh, on your interviews, then how significant a problem are public land access issues uh, to the Border Patrol sector chiefs that you interviewed? What, what is their feeling on? on uh... There were 17 Border Patrol agents in charge out of the 26 that we surveyed that told us that they had um, experienced access delays. However, in each, in not in every case, did that cause a problem in their ability to fulfill their function. For example, there were five that had to change their patrols as a result of endangered species. But all of those Border Patrol agents told us that that had not impacted their ability to apprehend and detect illegal aliens on Federal land. So there was a mixed bag. In some places, it had caused, the delays had caused an impact on their operations. In other places, it had not. Thank you very much. I know Congress wants to, and all of us at this table uh, want to make sure we have the proper balance in writing our laws. And uh, all your testimony today has been helpful. And I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some more questions. We'll do another round here, if possible. Mr. Taylor, um, can I ask you? We have talked a lot about whether Border Patrol can, can, can go in for under the exigent or emergency circumstances. Can you just tell me what is the difference between pro patrolling and going in for exigent or emergency circumstances? Patrolling is something that is done routinely, daily. It in involves two things, deterring people from crossing the border and detecting them once they have. Those are the two basic principles of patrolling the border. If you do not have access to the border, you can't patrol it. So you have to back off. The further you have to back off, the more territory you are ceding to the enemy. Well, so then can I follow up on that? Can you explain the obstacles the Border Patrol faces if they are blocked from building new roads or maintaining existing roads? And, uh, you know, is, is it is it just good enough to have a single road running through it? No. Let me qualify my background. I have been a field agent in the Border Patrol 26 years. The last 14 were in Arizona, so I worked that area. When you have a situation where you cannot get in there and pull somebody out that gets in trouble, you are best off not to send them in there. So what happens is the area doesn't get patrolled at all. I see. Ms. Thank you. Mr. Wood, uh, can you explain the big hatchet repeater MOU, what it is and why it is a concern? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the big hatchet is uh, the name of a, a mountain peak uh, in, uh, located in southern New Mexico. It is the sole uh, source for communication. Uh, historically, uh, there was a repeater up there. Uh, the land managers found out about it, and the Border Patrol was required to take it down. 
Since then, it's been put back up, but uh, with the restrictions that uh, make it very, very difficult to manage. As an example, uh, the Border Patrol will be required to take that down if that area is designated wilderness. The caveat to that is you can, they will not be able to take it down except through certain months of the year because of the lambing season for uh, some endangered species there. Uh, it's the highest peak in the area. It's, it's going to be subject to damage by lightning and other natural effects. If that repeater goes down from lightning, and it's during the period where the Border Patrol cannot access it for those uh, limitations, then that entire area is going to be without communication. And the Border Patrol agents assigned in there are going to be at uh, drastic danger. I, 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 as a former chief, would probably pull the agents out of there if that happens. It's just not worthwhile to take that kind of chances against one of our agents. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, last December, Agent Terry was murdered on the National Forest land. How should that tragedy influence this discussion? I, I mentioned earlier, Mr. Chairman, that uh, those uh, areas that border wilderness. And in this particular case, the Pajarita wilderness borders the Coronado National Forest on the south. The ingress into the United States of the bandits that were involved in that apparently came through the Pajarita up to the Coronado, stayed in the Tumacacri Highlands. And at the intersection of the Tumacacri Mountains and the Atascosa Mountains is where the gunfight happened where the agent was killed. And apparently the agents tried to follow the people that did the shooting back into Mexico and they went through the Pajarita wilderness, which the agents have no access to. And matter of fact, there's not even a fence there in many places. It's been down on the ground so long that the vegetation's covered it. I think this, is this the map that we were talking about? This is the area? Yeah. Yes, sir. So can you explain what we're looking at with that map? Okay, if you'll look in the lower right-hand corner where that arrow is, that's where the Nogales Border Patrol Station is. The next arrow to the left is coming up through the Pajarita, uh, more or less on the east side, and then the arrow on the left is the main corridor. They're coming from the west. And what they're going through, where you see that box, is what I call the kill zone. This is where the bandits, now there's two groups of bandits. There's people that are trying to protect their drugs and aliens, and the other side is trying to rip them off from those people. And both groups apparently are armed. Once they get past the kill zone, you'll look at the arrow in the upper right-hand corner. That's where the Border Patrol checkpoint is. And the arrows to the left follow the highlands and take the uh, aliens and the drug smugglers beyond the Border Patrol checkpoint. And the purpose of the uh, the, the box in there is to show that almost all of that kill zone is located on public land. And it is in the Coronado National Forest and pretty much in the northwest quadrant is where Agent Terry was killed. And in the northeast quadrant in a four-day period, uh, within the last 10 days, we found three bodies. Uh, we don't have a, a ruling yet on what caused the death. Also in the upper left-hand corner in December 2009 is where Agent Rousseau was shot. And we believe it was the same group of bandits that shot both agents. So if I can expand that just slightly, if you'll think about Nogales as a horseshoe, it is covered on the west by public land, it is covered by the east on public land, and it is all mountains. And the reason the alien smugglers use that is because when they have the high ground, they have the tactical advantage. They can see the Border Patrol coming, and the Border Patrol has to go to them. And the only way they can do that is on foot. Horses won't work in that area. Because in some of those places, to, 
traverse them, you have to go on your hands and knees. It's that steep. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. In, in more detail than I have. Mr. Kildee, I'm, I'm over here. I have a couple more questions. Did you have anything else further? Or are you? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, I have no Chaffetz? Then let me just ask two more questions of you all, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll give you, we'll let you go, actually. Let me do the first one for either Mr. Wood or Mr. Taylor. I mean, in, in a letter at the Fish and Wildlife Service to DHS uh, regarding the San Bernardino Wildlife Refuge and endangered species concern, the Fish and Wildlife Service asked the Border Patrol to stop doing road dragging operations to cut signs near the refuge. Can you just explain to us what cut sign, sign cutting, I'm sorry, is and why it's an important tool and what are the implications if the Border Patrol cannot do this or cannot use this tool? Yes, sir. As I alluded to earlier in my testimony, uh, sign cutting is one of the most uh, preferred and effective techniques that the Border Patrol has developed over the years. Sign cutting effectively requires that a road be parallel to the border if that's the area that you want to protect. Uh, they call it a drag road because they're frequently smoothed over by one uh, method or another uh, so that evidence of illegal entry is easily identified by the agents that are working that area. Now, one of the critical things of that is you have to have access. You can't effectively do sign cutting or drag roads away from the border. You've lost the funnel then where these entries occur and, and they spread out over large, large distance. So if, if we're not able to use that technique, we're losing a very, very valuable tool that we've developed over years. And I can, I can tell the committee, the Border Patrol agents now and previously were some of the best sign cutters in the country. Uh, I always have to, to mention that it's, a, it's an old technique, but it's been very effective for, for our agency. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chilton, I'll give you the last chance to comment on a question I had. Um, 2007, this subcommittee received a letter from one of your good friends, the Krentz family. And the Krentz family, the purpose of that letter was to oppose a new wilderness designation. The letter, Mrs. Krentz, stated the Border Patrol should not be excluded, nor should national security of the United States be sacrificed in order to create a wilderness area. We are in fear for our lives and that of our families and friends. I think you mentioned what happened to Rob Krentz within a year of that particular letter coming in. And um, I, would, I would ask you, I, this isn't a question. We know what happened down there. This is a sad situation, should never have been the place. And I realize that Mrs. Krentz was also hit by another accident, very difficult situations. Would you just extend our appreciation to that family and our concern? And I think one of the reasons why we're pushing forward with this, these concepts is because of the Krentz family and what they suffered down there. And if you'd do that, I'd be appreciative. I will. And she helped me prepare my testimony. And she's really, really angry that uh, wilderness areas are still being proposed. She's angry that uh, her husband's killer has not been found. And she believes that national security demands securing the border at the border. And I will be very happy to call her this afternoon and talk with her. Thank friend. you, Mr. Bishop. I appreciate that for all of you. Mr. Tierney, Thank you. you get the chance to ask the last question. That's highly unlikely, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> see my friend Mr. Chaffetz over there. I seldom get the last, last word with him. Uh, thank you. Ms. Mattel, I just want to uh, ask a couple of questions. I had to step out for a while, and I apologize for that, but I want to reiterate a little bit what, what I understand your reports to be, and, and uh, Ms. Stanton behind you, I, I thank you for your work. From what I understand it is that there is uh, no direct correlation between the environmental laws and the uh, wilderness laws and those that, um, that can't be resolved by the departments working together uh, in overcoming any conflict between national security and the intended uh, protection of those laws. Is that correct? 
What we found is that the MOU was designed to uh, take care of those conflicts okay. and make sure that the agencies work well together. Right. In some areas, the MOU is doing a really good job. In other areas, it is not as effective. Okay. Now, did your study look at all into those areas that weren't affected as to what was the cause of that lack of total effectiveness? What we heard repeatedly was that the land management agencies do not have the resources to always expedite Border Patrol's request. But the Border Patrol does have flexibilities under the existing laws to undertake a number of the environmental assessments itself. It can conduct programmatic environmental impact statements for the region. It can establish categorical exclusions for its activities, and none of that has been done yet. Okay. So we need to focus in on making sure that they use all their resources properly uh, at that area. We need to look at increasing the, the resources where they are lacking. And I suspect that we probably need to do some better training. Is that a fair thing to say, so to make sure that that MOU is operative and implemented in the, in the manner that it should be? Yes. Training was something that was brought up by almost every patrol agent in charge and every Border Patrol agent that we talked to. They would like to see more regular, face-to-face, -face, land unit-based training provided by the land management agencies so that they understand the environment that they are working in. Okay. So better training, better use of what resources do exist, better resources where they are lacking. What else would you recommend needs to the attention of this Congress? I believe that holding the agencies accountable to make sure that they can demonstrate to you that they have exhausted all of the available flexibilities that they have available to their disposal, and yet they are ha running into problems in doing their job. And if, and if Congress can hold them accountable, I did not hear any new information provided this morning by any of the agencies that testified that they have exhausted the, the, um, the authorities that Congress has provided them. So I, I think holding them accountable is essential. Okay. So it looks to me like so the Congress did its job in terms of writing the laws. It may not be doing all that it should be doing in terms of oversight yes. right now, and hence here we are. So thank you very much. I yield back to balance my time. If there are no other questions, fine. I, first of all, I want to thank this panel very much. Ms. Mittal, First, I want to appreciate the hard work that you and the GAO put into the report. I think it is very enlightening, especially if you read the entire report. And, yeah, I even did read the footnotes that you, you put did, in there. You did, sir. I was very impressed. To our three guests, Mr. Chilton, uh, I appreciate you being here for giving us the perspective of someone who actually lives on the border and faces these situations on a daily basis. Mr. Taylor and Mr. Wood, both of you, thank you for being here and, and representing what it was like to representing the view of a Border Patrol agent who is no longer worried about his status as a Border Patrol agent. So thank you for your testimony very, very much. I appreciate it. Um, it was especially valuable to all of us there. Um, let's see. I truly blah, 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 blah. If there is no further business, then without objection, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you again.